It's exciting to have you here, whether you're here at downtown campus or you joined us at Harrisburg campus or you're online, we're just glad to have you here. Um, can I start out just by saying, I consider myself a real man. Why are you laughing? That's not the joke. Uh, you're already laughing, man, that's an ouch. Uh, I, listen, I, I work out, I'm in fairly good shape, I provide for my family, I love my wife and kids and I'm faithful to them. Uh, I like eating red meat and hot wings. Uh, my son thinks I'm a superhero. Uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm a guy, okay? I'm a, I'm a man, right? Now, I realize, without question, there are, are men in this room who are more manly than me, okay? Uh, these are those guys, you know, they hunt, and they fish, and they grow beards, like, down to here where the birds live. That awesome, like, <laughs> incredible. I realize that I, like, I don't, I'm not all the way pegged at number 10, but if 10 is Chuck Norris, and one is Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, I'm tipping the scale the right direction. That's all I'm saying, okay? That is until I get sick. Now, ladies in the room, when your man gets sick, is it not true that a transformation takes place? And this man who was once Chuck Norris is now turning into like this Sheldon-y kind of, like, it's just like that, right? Th this clip uh, from the Big Bang Theory may kind of bring some context, so enjoy. Okay, now, to be fair, that's me, okay? When I get sick, that is who I become. Now, when my wife gets sick, she can tell me that she's sick. She's like, babe, I don't feel good. She can be like chills, fever, throwing up. She could be bleeding out of place, you know, and, and she'll be like, I got to get things done. I got to do things. I got to get dinner. I got to do these things, right? When I get sick, I turn into a worthless pile of goo, a big old whiny baby. Okay, now, how we approach this phenomenon is different. I, when I'm sick, I want Steph to heal me. And, and by healing, what I mean is I want her to baby me and feed me chicken soup and check my temperature. I want her to keep the kids away from me. I want her to bring me Sprite because my tummy's upset. And I want her to kiss my forehead and make me feel better. I want her to fix the scenario, fix the symptoms, get rid of the hurt, right? Steph has a different goal. Her goal when I get sick is to restore me. The word restore in the dictionary is defined as bringing back to the original condition. It's defined as to bring back into usefulness. Translation, she wants me to get up, go to the doctor, get some medicine, take it, feel better, and do some stinking laundry, right? We have a different goal. Now, we're in a four-week series talking about this. I want you to see this different picture. Healing, healing is about fixing the wound, okay? Restoration is about fixing the whole person. It's about resetting everything and bringing it back to fullness. Now, uh, as we jump into Who is Jesus, this series we're looking at, uh, his life, his claims, his ministry, and we're just asking the question, who is he really? And we looked at Jesus the man, we looked at Jesus the teacher. Today, we're looking at Jesus the healer. And I just want to share a, a fact out of scripture. The God of the Bible is a healing God. Okay, in the Old Testament, we read about this God. He's known by many names. One of them is Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah means the Lord. Rapha means healer. So Jehovah Rapha is the Lord who is our healer, right? That's the, the picture. And it expresses a broad range of healing. First of all, the one we think of, yes, he's a God of physical healing. In fact, the first time this word is used in scripture, it's used in Genesis chapter 20, verse 17, and it's describing physical healing. Uh, it says this, then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female servants so they could have children. So there's physical intervention, okay? He reached in, touched them physically and healed them. But he's also the God of spiritual healing. As you read the Psalms, you're going to read about King David. And King David, at one point, is crying out to God. After he sinned against God, he's, he's crying out to them, and begging God to heal not him physically, but to actually heal his soul. In, in Psalm 47, or excuse me, 41 verse 4, he says, O Lord, I pray to have mercy on me. Heal me, for I've sinned against you. He's not talking about, again, physical he, he needs healing in his very soul. Then there's, he's also the God of emotional healing. In the Old Testament, we read about a God who is full of compassion for the nation of Israel, his people, his chosen people. And as they cry out in distress, he will reach in and he'll heal them. And a lot of times it's not physically, it's emotionally as well. In Psalm 147, verse one through three, it says this, 
Praise the Lord. How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. Here it is. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He heals their broken hearts that are, that are just emotionally destroyed. So this is how God was known as Jehovah Rapha. He's the God who heals. 58 times in the Old Testament, that's the name used for God. And so if Jesus is claiming to be the son of God, he better be a lot of things, but he better be a healer. So that brings us to the message today. This message wouldn't be called Jesus the healer if he couldn't heal. And we read that Jesus Healing was a significant part of his ministry. In fact, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the 3,779 verses that make up those four Gospels, 727 of them, or roughly one-fifth of them, are about Jesus healing people. You know, so that's a lot of healing. So it might surprise you when I say healing wasn't his primary ministry. Jesus wasn't primarily a healer. You might say, man, if he wasn't a healer, I mean, that's a lot of healing and you would be right. But what I, I want you to note something. Jesus healed lots of people, but he didn't heal everybody. Right? If, if, if he's about healing primarily, why didn't he heal everybody? He could heal everybody. I mean, he healed sick and blind and deaf and crippled and lepers and he raised the dead. He could heal everyone. He could heal everyone, but he didn't. If his ministry was primarily about healing, you would think that he would heal everybody. He also doesn't hype up his healings. As you read the Gospels, you'll read like, for instance, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4, or Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, that Jesus heals somebody and then automatically, as soon as he's done healing them, he says, don't tell anybody. Like, just keep this to yourself. They usually don't listen to him. But he says, hey, don't spread the word. If his ministry is primarily healing, why would he not want them to spread the word? And the answer is because his ministry is not primarily healing. Healing's not the main event. So let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's look at uh, Jehovah Rapha. Again, we said Rapha means healer or physician, and we said it goes beyond physical healing. Well, it also goes beyond people. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 2 about a prophet named Elisha, and Elisha is at a place called Mara. The reason it's called Mara is because Mara means bitter, and the water of the stream is really bad. It's bad water, so they named the place Mara. And God does a miracle through Elisha, and God says, I've purified the water. He says, I've healed the water. And he uses this specific word for healing. So that it's not only physical healing, like he's putting the water back the way it should be. You see the picture? Then in 2 Chronicles 7.14, he says, hey, if my people who are called by my name, if they'll humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, but then I'll also heal their land. And again, he shows this picture of restoration. Here's, here's my point in all this. Jesus is not just about healing. He's about restoration. And that's something much, much bigger. God is not about just fixing what's wrong. He's about restoring everything to wholeness, to its useful state. It's with that in mind that I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, if you're in one of our Bibles, uh, we'll be on page 581. If you didn't bring your Bible, just raise your hand. As always, the ushers will run you one. And you can follow along. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand. We'll just give you one. Okay, just keep this one. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, page 581. Uh, if you're using version, we're, uh just go to Live, the Ransom Church, and you'll find all our notes there as well on your phone. But uh, what I want to do today is I want to point out to you three pictures of Jesus' ministry that show that he goes beyond healing, that he actually has a ministry of restoration, and then what that means to our lives. So three pictures of Jesus' restoration ministry. Uh, first, he ministered through preaching. Okay, we talked about this last week, how he was an incredible teacher. And, and people were enamored by what he taught. In fact, he, he, he commands us to, to dive into his teaching. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, page 581. Let's pick it up. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And so he's saying, hey, listen, my teaching ministry is important. He has a ministry of teaching. He's not just a healer. He's also a teacher. Second, he ministered through healing. And, and again, uh, just because he wasn't all about healing doesn't mean he didn't do it. In fact, he did it a lot. As we read through these gospels, you get to chapter eight of Matthew 
and he turns a sharp corner and you see him start healing people like crazy, a man with leprosy, a soldier's daughter, Peter's sick mother, two demon-possessed guys, uh, a paralytic, the blind, the mute. You know, he even raised a girl from the dead. He's doing healing. It was a huge part of his ministry. So he got preaching, he got healing. Then third, he ministered through deliverance. You might say, what's that all about? Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, starting with verse 28. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were possessed by demons met him. They lived in a cemetery and were so violent that no one could go through that area. They began screaming at him, why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance, so the demons begged, if you cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. All right, go, Jesus commanded them. So the demons came out of the men and entered the pigs, and the whole herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Here's what I want you to see in that story. The demons recognized Jesus. Like, they, they knew enough to be like, oh, man, Jesus is here, right? And, and they, they're scared because he has the power to cast them out. And so what I want you to get a glimpse of through these gospels is that Jesus preached and healed and delivered. He had a ministry of restoration, of making people whole. It wasn't just physical. It was about delivering them and restoring things to their normal, useful, God-given state. Now, if I stopped there, that would be great. God wants to heal you. God loves you. Thanks for coming, right? That would be, that'd be perfect. The problem is he doesn't stop there. I wish he did, but he doesn't. Watch Matthew chapter 10, flip over page 583, starting with verse 1. Then Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and heal every kind of disease and illness. Now, hold hold, hold up, hit the pause button. (laughs) Jesus, I'm fine when you're healing. That's cool. That's great. I'm fine when you're delivering. I'm fine. Your, Your preaching is awesome. But this is getting a little too close. It says now he takes 12 regular guys, these 12 guys he'd chosen that were following, guys just like you, guys just like me. And he gives them authority to do what he's been doing. He puts it on them. Verses 5 through 8. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Now watch this. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. You know what that is? That's preaching. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy. That's the healing. And cast out demons. Preaching, healing, deliverance. Translation, he says to them, you know this ministry, this preach, heal, deliver thing I've been doing? Here's the keys you drive. There's a little pressure. Now, do you remember the first time, uh, those of you who have a driver's license, do you remember the first time you drove a car? I do. I have some very specific memories that I would like to reveal to you now. Um, I remember I learned a few things the first time I drove a car solo, okay? One of the first things I I realized is that speed feels different in the front seat, (laughs) right? Okay, I used to ride in the back and my dad would be going 55 and I would be like, dad, I'm going to be 100 by the time we get there. Can you please speed up? It felt so slow. The first time I drove a car 55, I distinctly remember this. I remember because I was going to my friend Megan's house and I lived on the west side and she lived on the east side. I had two buddies in the back seat, so you know where this story's going. We drove, I drove all the way through town. I wanted to avoid the interstate. So I weaved my way all the way through town. The problem was I got to the east side, but she didn't live on the east side. She lived just east of town. Translation, highway. Translation, I had to go 55. And I remember I'm behind the wheel and the car is speeding up. Do you, have you watched Star Trek? You remember when you're on the bridge and the guy says, engage, and the guy hits the button and all the stars go like that? That's what happened. We started going and we hit warp drive. And I, like, my friends are in the back seat and they're going, Grandma, the pedal, it's the one on the right, bro. We can go fast. And I'm like, the, my skin is peeling off. I feel like we're going to die. The wheel is shaking, right? Now, granted, I was driving an 89 Ford Tempo. So that probably had a lot to do with it. But still, I'm like freaking out. My, behind the wheel changes the velocity of life. When that control is placed firmly on your shoulders, it changes things, doesn't it? The second thing I learned is that riding in the back seat does not necessarily mean you know where you're going, okay? I got behind the wheel, and suddenly this town that I'd lived in my whole life, that I grew up in, that I'd been all around, seemed 
vaguely familiar, as if I'd been there in a dream, right? Because I'd been riding in the back seat. So I didn't, like, I knew, you know, east side, central, I know where we are in town, but dad always drove. I didn't have to know street names. I didn't have to know. So I got behind the wheel and I realized, I have no idea where I'm going. I don't know where anything is. What am I going to do, right? So imagine how the disciples feel when Jesus all of a sudden hands them the keys. See, the whole time they've been with him, he's been doing the ministry. He's been preaching. He's been healing. He's been delivering. They've been in the back seat or at very best, riding shotgun. And so while he's doing all this ministry, they have a vague idea where he's going. They don't really know, do they? But they have a vague idea where he's going, and they're yelling things from the back seat like, hey, Jesus, why don't you hurry up and establish your kingdom already, right? Take over. Let's rock this joint. They have no idea what's coming, and Jesus hands them the keys, and he says, you drive. N.T. Wright describes it this way. Up until this moment, Jesus' disciples have been passengers in the car, and he's been doing the driving. They've been astonished at what they've seen, but he's made all the decisions, handled all the tricky moments, steered them through towns and villages, taken the criticisms, and come out in front. Now he's telling them to go off and do it themselves. It doesn't take much imagination to see how they would feel. You want us to do what? By ourselves? And you need to see this. Back up to verse 5, Matthew chapter 12, verse 5. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles. Now, don't miss this key word. This is the first time he ever calls them apostles. You might say, well, who cares? Here's why this is important. Up to this point, they've always been called disciples, and they still are. A disciple is a student, a follower, a learner. But here he calls them apostles because apostles literally translates sent out ones. These 12 backseat drivers have now been thrust into the driver's seat. They are men on a mission, not just as a sign of God's restoration, but they are part of his restoring ministry. He has taken his ministry, put it square on their shoulders. Now watch what happens in Mark 6, verse 12 through 13. So the disciples went, they went, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins, that's preaching. They cast out many demons, there's a deliverance, and they healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Preach, deliver, heal. Jesus' ministry, and he hands it to them. You need to understand this. Jesus is not primarily about healing. He's about restoration. He's about taking your life and not just fixing what's broken. He wants to restore you to your normal useful state. He's not just about making you feel better. He's about restoring us so that we can restore others. That's our call. Matthew, uh, there's a phrase here they use, kingdom of heaven. This phrase only appears in Matthew. Mark and Luke uh, use the phrase kingdom of God, but this phrase kingdom of heaven is, is unique to Matthew. He uses it 33 different times, and here's what it essentially means. He talks about how the kingdom of heaven is not just something we hope for in the future, but it's meant to be a present reality. You might remember when uh, we talked about the Lord's Prayer and Phil Wiseman taught us about this, when he talked about your kingdom come, your will be done. What God is saying is not God, come back and take us to your kingdom. Not, it's not something we're hoping to go to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make it through this earth and then go to heaven. But that it's the idea that we are called to reestablish God's kingdom here. We're called to a ministry of restoring this world and bringing his kingdom on earth now. That was his message to the disciples. It's his message to us as well. And that's incredibly humbling. In fact, you might be sitting here going, I can't do that. There's no way. I can't, I don't know enough. I don't, I can't preach. I can't heal. I can't deliver. I want to argue this morning that that's not the case. Did you know you're called to preach? Now, the good news for you is it means you, it doesn't mean you have to switch places with me and I get to sit out there and you get to come up here. But did you know that your life is a sermon? that your life is a story, that you are called to preach in the way that you live, in the way that you love, in the way that you show and share your faith, in the kind words that you speak, in the love you show for the least of these, through the power of your testimony, your life is a message. Your life is a sermon. How good a sermon is it? Because you're called to preach. Did you know you're also called to heal? This is one we struggle with because, boy, it's easy to go, well, that Bible stuff, that healing, that can't happen now, right? 
That can't be real now. Let me tell you a story. A little boy in our church named Micah. He's two years old. He was with his family, and they were riding ATVs, and the ATV rolled over on him. Okay? Uh, Micah, Micah wouldn't wake up. And I remember being in the hospital with the family, and I, I don't ever remember hearing such heartfelt prayers in my life as I did in that room begging God on Micah's behalf. And, and I, I remember being in that room, and God doesn't, I go to the hospital a lot. God doesn't always give me this, because you don't want to like lift up false hope and things like that. But it's like God said to my spirit, you need to share the message of hope that Micah's going to get better. And I said that. I said, hey, he's going to wake up. Like, I know that. I know this. Bo- I, he's going to wake up. So let's pray for him. And you call me. I said, I said to Brad and Amanda, you call me when he wakes up. I just, God just gave me that confidence. So I shared that word with them and I left. That night, they called. They said, can you bring the elders of the church and anoint Michael with oil like scripture says? So I gathered as many elders as I could. And we went into his room and I'll let them pick up the story. Listen to this. Our son Micah, who was uh, two at the time, um, got in a four-wheeler accident. It was rollover and it landed on top of him. And... Uh, he had lack of oxygen, so actually my mom and my sister Brittany um, revived him, and they brought him to Worthington and flew him to Sioux Falls. And um, this was on a Wednesday at noon is when it happened, and uh, he was not responding or waking up. It was terrible weather that day. He, the accident happened at about noon on Wednesday, and. Um, didn't get to Sioux Falls till about five o'clock, and then um, he was. They had him on a lot of sedation, and um, they kind of were going to ease off the sedation and hope that he would kind of wake up and come through. None of the CAT scans or anything showed anything wrong with his brain, so you know they kind of just thought it was going to be a really bad concussion and that he was going to pull through. But um, every time they would ease off the sedation, he can't, he wouldn't wake up like they were say, thinking he would, and so they finally. Um, It was Thursday afternoon. Um, We had called the elders of the church and decided um, to have him anointed with oil and have them pray over Micah and pray with us. And it was shortly after um, that happened that Micah woke up. So let me take you into the story as best I can. We go in with our elders and we pray over Micah. We lay hands on him and we anoint him with oil. And like five, five or 10 minutes, after we leave the room, he wakes up. We're, we're not even out of the hospital, okay? The elders, I, I, I've kind of put the timing together in my head. While, when Micah woke up, we were standing in the lobby of the church, I mean, of the, excuse me, of the hospital, having a conversation, and this is what our elders were saying. I've never done that before. I, I've never been part of that before. So these are elders who have never done this before, and God, folks, we have a ministry of healing. Now, it may be physical, it may not. Maybe God's calling you to help someone heal from loneliness. You could do that, couldn't you? For the people around you who are lonely, or they're ashamed of their past, or they're hurt, could you not come alongside them and love them, and and have a, a healing ministry? Maybe you just need to be that healing of friendship and love in your presence. Maybe for you, healing means you need to open your arms and heart and your home. Uh, we have a program called Safe Families that a lot of people are getting involved with where we, we pre-foster care step in and help moms who just have to get sober or have to get a job or have to do whatever and, and cl- clean things up so that they can come back to their families and we can restore. And so we just step in and we provide home care for them in those moments. And, and maybe you're called to open your home. We have a lot more people who are feeling called Beyond that, to adoption, Phil and Natalie Wiseman, you know, are, are working on an adoption um, from Democratic Republic of the Congo right now. But we have multiple couples in our church who are feeling called to, to international or domestic stateside adoption. In fact, I'm excited to share with you that thanks to Safe Families and how it's wrecked my heart, my wife and I are now one of those couples. God's called us to adopt, so we're going to be open in our home, you know. And, and so we're excited about that. Maybe for you, it's life groups, okay? Uh, maybe. Your call is just to be in life groups so you can lean on each other in community. Maybe you're called to to be a healing touch by visiting in the nursing home, someone who's lonely through our visitation ministry. If you're a Christian, you're called to be a healer. 
So we're called to preach, we're called to heal. Third, God's calling you to deliver. Did you know that? And that's another one that we're like, I don't, I don't understand that very much. If, if you are unfamiliar with that and you want to learn about it, um, I'm looking for people to go with me uh, to Zambia in November, and you will get wrecked there. I mean, it just, the, spiritual warfare is prevalent. If you want your eyes open, go to Zambia or go to Mexico, and God will pull back your blinders. And what's sad is not that those things exist there. What's sad is that those things exist here, but we don't have the eyes to see it. Our eyes are, are closed to it. Scripture clearly lays this out in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is a spiritual battle we're in, and God has given us the ministry of deliverance. Maybe for you it's not from demon uh, possession, but, but certainly we need to be part of delivering people from hurt and from fear, and from oppression, and from addiction as we walk with them through these tough areas of life, right? Maybe you need to be part of delivering somebody in their marriage. Maybe their marriage is falling apart, and you need to inject God's spirit into that. You need to coach them and mentor them. Maybe you need to become part of our marriage mentors program, whatever it is. Maybe you need to help people with their finances. We got tons of people who are financially upside down and could use some financial coach and some helping and, and, and walking through that, and maybe that's your job. In fact, I want to take you back into Micah's story and what getting finances under control did in their life. So watch this. After Micah's accident, he said a few words to us, but um, then kind of after we had gotten home, that he quit talking altogether. We had no answers to why he quit talking. He just, he didn't, you know, he, he would try. He tried to, he actually would mouth words, but nothing would, he never said a word to us for probably three weeks after the accident. And um, Brad and I have been wrestling with tithing and we know that that's something that we needed to do, but we just kept saying we don't have the means. We had just had a new baby and it was like, no, we can't. Once I go back to work, yes, we'll tithe again. But it just, we, we never did. Amanda said that, you know, I feel that God's calling us to tithe. And we've been wrestling with tithing for a long time and uh, just didn't have the means to do it. And, and I said, well, let's do it. So. Uh, she went online and did the automatic tithe online. And within probably 10 minutes after she clicked OK, um, we're tithing, um, she was reading a book to him and Micah started talking to her. Started saying blue, red, one, two, three. And, and uh, that's the first words he said basically after about three weeks of not talking. Listen, if you're a Christian, if you call yourself a believer, you are called to preach, heal, and deliver. It's not my job. It's not the church's job. Like we are called to be a people who preach, heal, and deliver. And you might say, how do you know that I can do this? Like you don't, I got problems of my own. You don't know what I'm going through. How do you know that I have this? Well, if Christ is in you, his is a ministry of restoration. And he wants to restore you so that you can restore others. It says so in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We read verse 17 a lot. We usually ignore verse 18. So let me read the whole thing to you. This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's the part we read and we're like, hey, God, thanks for making me new. But we ignore this part. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to himself. We are called to preach, heal, and deliver. So I want to leave you with a final thought before we move to the challenge here. Uh, you might be saying, I'm too, I'm too mad. I'm too broken. I can't. I got too many problems of my own. If you're too broken, consider this. The fastest road to healing yourself is pouring your life out in restoration of others. When you begin to give your life away, pour your life out and make others whole, you're going to find that God brings a healing of your own. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to um, just consider these two challenges. And I don't, I don't know where you're at with these things, but challenge number one is simply this. Do you need to be restored? You know, there's, we're going to open the altar shortly. And if you're saying, man, I need that in my life. And you want to come and you want to be prayed over for healing and restoration. Our elders are available, uh, several of them. And they're going to be here to, uh, to pray over you, to anoint you with oil in hopes of healing. Now, listen, that's not a guarantee of healing. It's just an act of faith, an exercise of faith, believing in God's power to heal. Ultimately, it's up to him and, and whatever he chooses is fine. But if we don't ask, he can't answer. And so this is our, our chance to say, God, would you heal me? 
could be physically, emotionally, spiritually. And if you need that, we're going to open the altar in just a second. But before we do, the second challenge is this. Where does God want you to bring restoration to others? You might be saying, man, I'm a Christian, but I don't even know where to begin on that stuff. If you just want more information, there's a box on the hub you can check. We'll get a staff or a volunteer uh, in contact with you about what it might look like in your life as a Christian to be called to preach and heal and deliver. If you want to have that deeper conversation, check that box. We want to, we want to talk with you. Uh, but right now as the band leads us in a song, I want to open the altar and I want you to come. If you need to be prayed over by the elders of the church, the altar's open. So Heavenly Father, would you give us courage to step out and to kneel before you in hopes of healing, knowing full well, God, that you are ultimately sovereign, but believing and asking you to do a miracle in our lives. I pray that you give those who need to step out the courage to do so in your name. Amen. If that's you, as the band sings, just come.